So today we're going to replace the clutch on this uh, BMW R1100RT. Uh, you'll remember this spike from a few previous videos when we did uh, oil analysis and checked out whether or not a bike with 200,000 kilometers was shot or not. Uh, one of the things that came up in checking the bike out is that there seemed to be some clutch slippage. Now it could be a few things that are going on inside this clutch. Um, obviously, I believe it's the friction uh, uh, disc, and that's what we've, we've ordered. We've got actually a brand new complete clutch kit. Uh, because this bike was manufactured in December of 1997, and it was after January of 1998 where BMW changed the clutch setup, we have a retrofit kit uh, that goes into this bike, so it gets the newer style clutch. In other words, we can use the newer style friction disc going forward, but you have to order the complete clutch kit in order to make all that work. Um, the other thing that it could be, it could be our splines are messed, our, our input shaft splines on the transmission. We won't know that until we get it apart, unfortunately. Um, could be our drive shaft. Could be our drive shaft has, uh, ha has turned and become uh, out of phase and is slipping inside the drive shaft since basically the, the yoke that goes to the final drive uh, and uh, the drive shaft part and the yoke that goes into the transmission output shaft are actually just held together with uh, some rubber and some, some compressed and hardened rubber. So, um, you know, I did launch the bike pretty hard trying to do a zero to 60 test on it and that's when things really started to, to, to go sideways. So, you know, it could be a whole lot more than just the clutch once we get into it, but we're going to find out today and uh, figure out what we need to do to get this bike back out on the road. Okay, so I've obviously done quite a bit of work already. We have the uh, fuel tank removed. We have the battery removed, obviously, and all the parts for it were a long time coming, of course, with COVID um, was, uh, was uh, in all the logistic uh, issues that are going on. Uh, so it was like two months from the time that I ordered these parts for them to come in. So they came in this past week, so that's what we're going to do is we'll start taking the transmission out. Um, so unfortunately, I missed some of the footage of me taking this stuff off, but I figure that if you don't know how to take off your fairings and you don't know how to take off your fuel tank, um, you may not want to try this one all by yourself. Uh, you might want to take it to a professional to have this done. This is the first time that I've taken apart uh, an R uh, transmission from an R engine uh, in a BMW and uh, it's going to be a learning experience for me as well. So we'll go step by step through it or as much as possible. And we're going to focus today on the most important stuff, which is um, removing the, the final drive, removing the uh, swing arm, uh, removing the transmission and how you do that while the uh, subframe basically stays in place. In other words, this frame is going to come and swing up out of the way, but it's going to stay connected to the main frame and to the engine. And that's one of the cool features of, of BMW is that uh, they've engineered that in so that you can just flip this up and the gearbox comes out, transmission comes out. We're going to learn a lot today and uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, it's just the friction pad um, that we don't have any twisted splines or uh, damaged drive shafts because when you get into these older bikes now um, the parts are available they're just really expensive and already I've spent more than the bike is worth in parts so we'll go from there We have already removed all the screws from the airbox, so the airbox uh, is all free. Uh, I have disconnected the clutch cable down here at the bottom for the transmission. Uh, there's also uh, two wires, two sets of uh, wiring harnesses that run up the other side of the bike to uh, uh, about the midpoint of the frame, and uh, we need to unclip those. Those wiring uh, where it goes into the main harness, uh, those wires are for the gear shift indicator. In other words, what gear you're in and the neutral switch so that we can see uh, whether or not the bike's in neutral. I am going to run into some uh, difficulty here with the exhaust system. This exhaust system is very old. I did have to use some map gas to uh, loosen off the bolt down here on the uh, clamp uh, in order to get it free. It did come free. Um, however, 
there are some additional bolts down here uh, that are on rubber mounts that go basically into a mount on the catalytic converter. Uh, these are hooped and I'm going to have to remove those. Now, uh, bikes made, I think it was after 2000, no longer have these mounts. BMW realized that they were crap and uh, basically serve no purpose. They're like an anti-vibration mount for the exhaust system, which is kind of useless. And um, they stopped using this mount. So uh, we're gonna wind up breaking these bolts and we're not gonna look to replace them. We're just gonna leave them out uh, probably and, and, and go from there. But yeah, they're gonna need to be drilled out. They're gonna be a big pain in the butt and uh, we'll have lots of fun with that one. Um, but that's what we're going to do there. Um, also, uh, we've already removed the uh, brake caliper from the back. We've removed the uh, ABS and speed sensor and these will stay basically with the subframe. There's a few other things we've got to do. We've got to unclip the brake lines right here, uh, basically unscrew that from the engine block. And we also need to remove the, uh, the fuel line that goes into the uh, throttle bodies up here. The reason that we need to remove that is that these fuel lines are actually secured to the airbox and uh, I need to be able to bend up out of the way. So what's left for nuts and bolts that we need to do besides the ones, the topics that I've already covered, uh, we need to basically unbolt the subframe from the uh, from the, the bike. There's four bolts in total. There's two on each side. Uh, I'll go through some close-ups on that. And then there's these nuts that you see protruding right up in here. And these just need to be slacked off. And that's the pivot point then for the subframe is once those are sl slacked off and we have the rest of the bolts out, we'll be able to bend the frame upward and uh, get it up out of our way. So now that we've got our clamp all loose, those bottom POS is uh, cut away, um, we're going to take the catalytic converter uh, O2 sensor out, unhook it from the main wiring harness. It's kind of jammed up in here and then it threads up into the harness here. We're gonna need to snip some zap straps and unthread this guy. twist and then pop apart. There we go. That's threaded quite deep. I wasn't expecting that. Lots of threads on there. Okay, so we're just going to fish that down and out of the way so that it does not going to interfere with anything. And now we're just going to wiggle the pipe and try to get it to come backwards. This is, might just spread this just a bit more. Take that nut bolt and that little D fitting off and just spread this really far so that it's completely off of the pipe. Okay, so fingers crossed this should come out smoothly. There it is. The rest of the way. So we've got our fuel line off, our injector wires off. Now we just need to move this uh, run to the air box. Make sure that's good and loose on both ends. Now these don't come off, they slide back into the air box. Trying to go back, just make sure you don't damage the, the ring that's inside there. And back it goes. All right, so now we're at the uh, ready to uh, remove the final drive. So the final drive is held in two points. Um, the first one is the paralever arm, which comes down here, which has a, a bolt that runs through. We're going to leave that guy in place for a few minutes, and then we're going to uh, also have to remove this uh, uh, blind pin and adjustment pin, and the adjustment pin is on the other side of that. And basically what that's doing is it's going into a uh, bearing um, and allows this 
final drive to kind of pivot up and down as you go over bumps. So there's a lot going on here, but basically what we're going to do first off is start by loosening this guy right here. Now, I am gonna swing all this stuff out of the way because we may have to use map gas in order to get that free. So from the factory, this pin came with a lot of uh, thread lock on it. Uh, now, BMW has since changed that, and if you take that out, you're supposed to clean it up and reinstall it dry. You're not supposed to use any thread lock. That can make removing this uh, a bit of an issue. Now, I suspect with the mileage that's on this bike that that pin has come out before. Hopefully it was by a knowledgeable uh, technician. So we're just gonna see if we can loosen this off. We've got our, our 12 millimeter Allen key and our breaker bar, and we're just gonna see. And I'm gonna say the answer is no. That somebody may have put that back in there with some thread lock or it has never been off before. So before we get the map gas out, we're gonna need to cut this uh, zap strap uh, down here on the boot. And this is what kind of led me to think that, you know, maybe somebody had had that out before, but maybe they just lubed the drive shaft splines and put it back together. So we're gonna get this boot kind of pulled up out of the way and there is some oil that's coming out and this oil kind of looks like it kind of looks like uh, transmission oil when we get it apart we'll find out where the thing's leaking from what's dry and what's not and we'll go from there so a little disappointing, but we're gonna have to soldier on as it were. So with the map gas, you'd want to heat up the nut and not the aluminum around. What this is doing is it's melting the uh, thread lock compound that is holding that pin in place. And I think you want to get it somewhere up around 260 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So you don't have to heat it that much, but uh, it's going to melt that thread lock compound. And I don't have a, my heat gun out here. So we're just going to, or my infrared heat gun. So we're just going to go by feel and you see how easily that turned. And again, all we're doing here is just getting this loose to that point. So now we're going to move over to the other side. So again, with the map gas, all we want to do is heat up the pin. Try not to heat the aluminum. need as much heat on this side first thing we're gonna do is just try to that lock nut get that moving there we go so that's loose and now now hopefully we can also Get this pin moving. There it goes. So before we take that all the way out, I'm just gonna move the scissor lift up just to make sure we've got support on the final drive. Just gonna support it on the rotor for now. Just put a little bit of tension on it so that it doesn't fall or twist or anything like that when we take this pin out. So as I had suspected, yes, there is thread lock on these pins um, coming out and that's what they look like right there. You can see the thread lock 
that's on there, red thread lock. Um, again, when you put these back in, you don't use thread lock. We're just gonna clean this up and uh, put it back in dry. So with the scissor lift in place, we shouldn't have any issues. Uh, we should be able to pull this pin out and everything kind of stay there because this pair lever is still attached. It's all bolted up still. Um, and before I take this final pin out, I am going to just make sure that that, that guy there is, is the nut is off. Um, So I'm just gonna leave that bolt in there. I don't wanna take that out, otherwise everything could just spill off the back. Uh. Wow, there is lots of thread lock on this guy. And it's solidified again. Okay, so there's the pin on that one. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to bring this uh, scissor lift down and the final drive should be able to just swing out of the way. And there it is. So now we can... Take this bolt out of the pair lever. And we have removed our final drive. So you gotta be careful that the oil doesn't come out the uh, speed sensor hole. When you set this down, I did wanna look inside. It's hard to say um, if the oil is coming from the final drive, it could be. That oil really isn't going to hurt anything. Next up is the swing arm. And the swing arm basically has exactly the same setup. We have a blind pin on this side that goes into a bearing and we have an adjustment uh, pin on the other side. Looks just like the one that came off the final drive. Um, and that one there is uh, again all the same size. It's a 12 millimeter Allen key and uh, uh, then a 30 millimeter socket. Do the blind side first, we're just gonna heat that up. There it goes, Woo. A little bit of smoke. broke loose so yes blue thread lock on this one if you're keeping track let's go to the other side do the same thing over there now with these wires the, for the transmission uh, again I said that these ones are for the um, neutral switch and the gear shift indicator we got to get these out of here anyways, so we're just going to thread them back through the frame. I'm just going to wrap them there around that shock bolt for a minute. The shock bolt is halfway out, um, just holding up the uh, swing arm right now. just want to get these out of the way. When I use my map gas, I don't want any of the wiring harness uh, being damaged. Let's see first off if... We can get the lock nut to move. Yeah, that moved, good. And we'll see if we need the gas or not. No, nope. don't need gas on this one.
feels like there's thread lock, but being blue thread lock instead of red thread lock. Not so bad. So this swing arm, the reason I left the shock bolt in there is that I just want that being supported there while we take this out. There we go, there's the pin for that side. Take the pin the rest of the way out on the right side. These are coming out a whole lot easier. So again, here's what that guy looks like. The pair lever arm down here, we can take that out or we can leave it in. Um, I'll probably wind up taking it out because I think it's going to be in the way. It's already loose. Uh, you can leave it in though if you're not, if you're taking the transmission out and putting the transmission back in. Um, you can leave that in, but for me, I've already got it loose. I'm just going to take that out, set it aside, put this guy back in. For now. Okay, so what's left is to remove the bottom shock bolt. This should be fairly straightforward now. And now to remove the swing arm, you just need to basically bring it down on an angle and make sure you clear the shock and off it comes and there we go swing arm is off next up is to take the drive shaft out and well the good news is the transmission output shaft seal is dry so it's not our transmission that's leaking uh, now we just need to get the drive shaft off and when I did this on my 1200 and made a, one of the first videos I had ever made uh, with that, people were like, oh, you don't just pry the drive shaft off. Oh, there's a, there's a clip that goes in there and on and on and on. And on the particular year that I had of R1200, uh, it did not have that. And same thing with this. 1100 uh, drive shaft. All you're doing here is sliding the uh, the drive shaft back. It is a long ways on there and it's hard to move. So what you do is you insert a pry bar basically onto there and you pry it out and off it comes. Uh, there isn't a circle clip in anywhere in there like there isn't it's just basically friction that holds that on remember I said that the drive shaft could have failed and you see that this part right here is just being held on with rubber but I would say that these splines have been looped so that's a positive sign uh, despite the fact that somebody had went and put back a bunch of thread lock shouldn't do but yeah this the universal joints look good now that our swing arm is out of the way we need to uh, remove the bolts that hold the subframe to the transmission and the engine and then uh, loosen off the nuts at these pivot this pivot point so uh, the bolts are there's only four of them um, there's one back here uh, that I've already loosened off and uh, basically it goes in uh, across the length of the bike so it goes in that way. So it's back here on the transmission. That's out of the way. Uh, we have one more up here. It's kind of hit, tucked underneath this wiring harness. So we'll go ahead and take that one out. There we go. These bolts are the same length as well on uh, all sides. So you don't necessarily have to keep them in the order. Uh, that you find them and then the other 
piece that we need to loosen off is this nut and it's a lot easier to see on the other side but basically you just have to slack it off you don't have to take it all the way off and this is the pivot point for the subframe so that we can move the subframe upwards so just going to slack that off make sure it's just finger loose and uh, we're going to do the same thing on the other side now everything's loosened off now before i did take those bolts out i did set up my uh, uh, ratchet strap basically there's a soft tie that goes around the neck of the frame there and then we go back um, along the bike and then just have it uh, tied around the uh, the luggage rack in the back so this is how we're going to move the subframe up so before we start cranking on things to get carried away just want to make sure that we've got fuel lines off um, the ear box is loose okay oh and uh, one more thing I just about forgot, and this is why we do these checks at the end. Um, I did want to take these nuts off of the, uh, the battery box. Here. And the reason being is, is that once this is up and out of the way, um, these can be kind of a pain to get to. So what I want to do is uh, uh, just quickly take those out. And uh, this nut that goes through the bottom of the battery box and is actually a, a rubber mount that goes into the transmission. So. Uh, hopefully there's no issues with those ones and I did loosen them off I just didn't take them out take a look around on both sides make sure that nothing is hung up and in a position that's gonna cause us grief now as we go as we start to move this subframe up um, we are going to have to stop and double check and make sure that nothing's binding. Uh, there are ties that are caught on stuff and anything that basically is going to get in the way. So we want to be very careful with that. So now that we've got this guy up just a little bit, there's a few things that we need to take care of. Um, the first one is the crankcase vent. Um, and that's, I've got a clamp that's holding it onto the air box there. Uh, we need to take that off because this air box needs to come all the way out. So we're going to take that off. Now I don't have that tool that you see to make those clamps so this becomes a bit of a pain what we wind up doing is destroying this one and then we'll have to use a, a little hose clamp afterwards all right so that guy's off so there we go crankcase hose is off of the air box now it's going to move to the other side because we have another issue over there so over on this side the wiring harness comes down and there is a um, zap strap that's that's holding the wiring harness onto the airbox and again the airbox is going to come all the way out so we need to snip that and get this wiring harness kind of free um, there are things that get lodged and in the way so we need to make sure that we've got wiring harness in particular because I don't um, repaired wiring harnesses are sketchy at best and uh, we want to make sure that we don't have to do that or worse you have to try to buy uh, a used wiring harness for this bike
I like it. So with that, the ear box is out. And while the ear box is out, I'm just going to check to make sure there's nothing down in the bottom of the ear box. Recently on one of the forums that I belong to, uh, a gentleman had posted a picture of his R1100 or 1150 RT and uh, he'd had some uh, squatters take up residence in his air box and um, created quite a mess. Um, when you get rodents down into the into the filter area, then basically all of their their food or droppings or whatever they're they're chewing up can fall down into the bottom of that air box. So so I thought I would double check, but we look like we're rodent free. All right. So to take the transmission out, um, we need to use the first of two special tools that I had to purchase for this job. And hopefully I don't have to buy a third. I think I have a plan to get around using a third special tool BMW recommends. But basically there's these locator pins um, that go into the back of the transmission. And um, what these pins are for is to make sure that you slide the transmission on and off of the bell housing absolutely straight so you don't damage the push rod for the uh, clutch. Uh, or uh, anything else and when you put the transmission back in everything lines up properly makes it easier to put it back on so we need to put these pins in two locations so those are the first bolts we're going to take off on here on the back um, according to the shop manual the first one is up here by the left intake uh, that's where we're going to take this first bolt out So that bolt removed, we are going to replace that bolt with one of these guide pins. And basically, I mean, you can make these yourself. I just didn't really have the time. I found them actually fairly cheap. I'm gonna post a link in the video here and they came very quickly. So I was mucho happy with that. So you don't have to put that in. You don't have to tighten those pins down. That's fine. Um, I am going to do this though with those pins. I am just going to put a little bit of penetrating fluid on them just to help with sliding the transmission out. I don't want anything hung up on those pins. The other pin that we need to put into the transmission is down here on the bottom. And it is the one closest to the uh, exhaust pipe. This guy down here. So that's where the other pin goes. So these are the first bolts that you take out and the last bolts that you put in when you put the transmission back in place. And there is also this little bracket that extends between the two sides. So in order to get that down, I'm going to have to loosen this off as well. I can just take this one out and go back with the pin. But there's a little metal bracket that goes from one side to the other. I'm not sure what that bracket does. Now this kind of bothers me a little bit. You can see the amount of, of corrosion that's on this bolt. Um, so we may have a little trouble breaking the transmission loose. So again, you don't have to put those locating pins in all the way, tighten them down or anything silly like that. Just need to put a few threads in there and uh, that's it. So now we can take the rest of the transmission bolts out. So now we're almost ready to try sliding the transmission back. I'm here by myself, so I need to try to work smarter. <laughs> so 
so I'm going to use this scissor lift to help move the transmission back just to help me with the weight. I'm not overly concerned about not being able to lift it, just it being awkward. So the only other thing that we have to worry about when it comes to this guy is those rubber mounts that go into the battery box. And you see one's up here and the other one's up here, but you notice this wiring harness. There's two pieces of wiring harness that kind of loop around that mount. Um, go for the negative cable and where it's the other one here. It goes into the main harness for something. So we need to basically grab our pry bar and uh, get this up when we take the transmission out high enough that we clear that wiring harness. Kind of a pain for sure. I, I, I guess that's the only place they could route them. Wires in the way. This is a real pain in the butt, I gotta say. Look at that wiring loom. Now, wiring har looms and harnesses of this era, and it didn't matter if it was a car or a bike, they used um, plastics that were made from soy, uh, soybean. And this is why rodents really like to attack this area. We have major issues with that. Um, anywhere there's rats in particular, they like to get in there and eat that. So. We'll have to address this part of the wiring harness when the transmission's out. But right now, what's giving me the most grief is this guy right here, because it's not... It's not easily moved. And what that is, is the ground strap that bolts to the top of the engine. Nasty. So, it should be thick enough. It's not a single wire. It looks like it's one solid ground strap. Uh, it's a number of large copper strands. I shouldn't damage that getting this up and through. But, man, there it goes. It just does not want to move forward. There it goes. Now it looks like I've cleared it. Okay, so I've cleared it enough, I should be able to get the transmission most of the way up now. Be able to wiggle it now, yeah, there goes the transmission, guys. Just like that. Our transmission is out. So now we can start to inspect things and find out where our problem is. Those splines in the clutch are still there. I was worried about the transmission input splines, input shaft splines. Those actually look really good. Um, doesn't look like they were lubed, but it doesn't look like I destroyed them uh, doing that zero to 60 power run. Also, there isn't as much corrosion around the transmission as I thought there would be. And the transmission, other than this wire, came out pretty good. So I certainly hope the issues that we've had been experiencing were in our clutch. Now we can take that apart to see. So the clutch is held on with these six bolts right here. And in order to remove those bolts, we just need to unthread them. But um, the issue is, is you may wind up turning the engine um, and finding it difficult to get any leverage on these bolts. So one of the things that you do, there's a, of course another BMW special tool, because there always is, to assist with that or you can just take your pry bar and just kind of gently hold it against the teeth don't reef on it don't you know you don't need to do that just hold it against the uh, starter ring gear teeth and uh, 
hopefully you can get that broken loose. So I'm just going to break these loose. These are not heavily torqued. When we assemble it, I'll remember the torque spec, but uh, they're not crazy. So the clutch is definitely like fixed on these pins. Here there's a fair amount of dust. This, I thought this would just basically come apart real easy. It's not. Yep. So this is the part that's connected to the engine and uh, spins away and it comes in contact with this piece on that side. And uh, that's the friction plate. And you can see that with that friction plate that it is worn right down to the rivets. Oh my goodness, yeah. So, we're almost flush with the rivets. Let's grab the new one and compare. So that's comparing the new one with the old one. And you can see what a thickness difference there is between them. Basically, this old one is half the thickness of the new one. So, this was our problem, a worn out clutch. I am glad we're going to change everything though. I do like that, and that we're going to wind up changing everything out and replacing with all new. So now we're ready to reinstall the, uh, the, the clutch, or rather put a brand new clutch into this bike. Uh, I've basically got new parts for everything except for the ring gear or the flywheel. This part right here that's mounted to the engine and I was concerned that I would have to change this washer out that's on the back that holds the uh, the, the flywheel in place uh, everything looks good back here uh, cleaned it up uh, after we shut the cameras off yesterday and uh, looked it over teeth on the ring gear are all, all good we don't have any issues there so that's just gonna stay the way it is so when we start with the clutch on this bike, that's backwards. Um, it starts with the, the 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 spring. And this is the spring. Basically, when you activate the clutch, there's a rod that sticks in the back here and compresses or pushes this uh, spring back in towards the engine. Uh, the concave area here faces against the back of the bike like this, back of the engine. So it sits in there like so. So when that's pushed, then you wind up getting um, that separation between the uh, dry plate and the friction plate. Next up is the, the dry plate. So this dry plate uh, then is, is made it to the, to, to the back of the engine. And this is where the power is being transferred through um, to the back of the bike and to the transmission. So it's gonna sit up here like so. And then attached to that is the friction plate. And the friction plate, here's our new one. Uh, you'll notice that it has basically two different uh, flanges here on the uh, splines. It has a much shallower and a much longer section right here. So that longer section points towards the back of the bike. So basically our spring's gonna be up there. Uh, this uh, dry plate, our friction plate and then this other dry plate which holds it all together now I did wipe all these down with uh, uh, brake clean and this is a brand new set of gloves I may change them one more time yet before I even go into this you want to make sure that all of these surfaces are as clean as possible and you don't want any chance of getting any oil on them or any sort of lubricants on them which is a little bit uh, of a of a challenge so there's a few things that the different manuals call for lubrication on and I'm gonna default to 
Uh, the majority of, of the technicians who uh, work on these bikes know things way better than I do uh, about working with these bikes. So with this spring area, there is a little bit of molly lube that goes along this area here, basically the contact surface. And you can kind of see where there had been some lube previously up in here. And that's just to help the plate flex a little bit uh, as you activate the clutch. The other thing I'm gonna point out while I'm back here is that uh, there's a mark right up here. So what that mark does is it's our starting point for um, balancing the, the clutch with the flywheel. If we take a look at our first plate, we're gonna find uh, another white mark just like that one. And then the other, the one, the plate that goes closest to the engine also has a white mark on it. And those are balancing marks. So basically those are the heaviest points um, on this plate. So all of these marks have to sit 180 degrees apart from each other. So our mark on this plate is right here. Uh, it has to be 180 degrees from that mark right there. So it's gonna sit uh, down here, like so. And then the final plate on the end, the white mark that's on it is gonna be another 180 degrees. So it's gonna sit over here. Basically, one mark, two mark, three mark. And that's supposed to keep all of these things in balance. Now, I have been told that the BMW clutches um, that you get now from directly from BMW or in some case, some aftermarket clutches, maybe the ones that come from uh, China, don't have this type of marking on them anymore. They're not balanced. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a, a big deal, uh, but this one does have the balance markings on them, so we're gonna respect those markings and make sure we put this together properly. So, we're gonna, the other thing that we need to do in order to put this together properly is uh, another BMW special tool, and that's this uh, clutch alignment tool. And this clutch alignment basically goes through everything, sits in here, and uh, helps align as we put this all back together, um, our plates and our spring. I mentioned that you don't necessarily have to um, uh, change out these bolts that came out of the old clutch, um, that they can be reused because there's not a lot of torque on them. Uh, I don't know, I, I, that's a recommendation from a BMW technician, um, but you can reuse them if you absolutely have to, that it's not critical. Uh, it doesn't matter, we've got brand new bolts here. So we're gonna put brand new bolts in place and make sure that we've got everything buttoned up um, as cleanly as possible so that we don't have any issues down the road. So that's what's going on right now and we're gonna start with uh, putting this clutch together. We have this lightly lubed up, I'm not 100% sure on it. That's what the manual that I am using calls for. Um, so there'll probably be a BMW technician out there will go like, no, we don't do that anymore. Uh, I see the point of it. I also see the point of not putting anything in there that could potentially get onto the friction disc. So I'm about 50-50 on it. I don't know. I'm going to stick to what the manual says and we're just going to put that back up there. So I'm going to set that aside for a minute and I'm going to change gloves since I did get some something dirty on my hands before I touch the friction plate and the uh, dry plates. Let's start them in the order that we're um, going to assemble them. So that's going to be the part that goes closest to the spring. We need to make note of where that balance mark is, that white mark right there. And we need to make sure that the balance mark that's on this outer plate is 180 degrees apart. So we need to make sure balance marks are 180 degrees apart so I'll slide that in there our spring then goes on the other side of this we're gonna take our special tool 
put it in there. Oh, it didn't hold it together. That didn't work. Damn gravity getting in the way. Okay. So our special tools in there. I'm just going to hold it like that for now. We need to make sure that we line this up accordingly to the other balance marks. There's one, there's two, like that. So where there's no balance mark, <laughs> that's where we're going to have that one. So that one goes up here by this balance mark. Okay. Now this is a little difficult to do without an extra pair of hands. But we'll give it the community college try. There it is. And we'll stick our centering tool in there. Now there's going to be some resistance for sure, uh, simply because you've got no You got the spring pushing back now. You got all these meaty clutch plates in there. Full thickness friction plate, full thickness drive plates. So we're just gonna get a few of these started. And again, everything should turn freely when it comes to the locating tool. Basically got a little bit of tension on those bolts. We haven't torqued them yet. Uh, I just flipped the um, uh, clutch locating pin around. This is another attachment that goes on it. It fits, fits multiple BMWs. Uh, but one thing about this pin is it goes all the way through to the spring plate. And I just want to make sure that everything's aligned properly, that there's no issues. It, what's most important is that the, uh, the the spring plate and the friction plate align in the center of the you know, back of the engine and because of the spring plate fitting it really can't go anywhere it has to sit in the center so making sure that this um, uh, friction disc basically is aligned dead center to the back because that's where your transmission is going to slide into the input shaft on the transmission is going to slide into there and so it has to be perfectly aligned otherwise you're not going to get anywhere so we're just going to leave that in as we go uh, time to torque these down these six bolts are torqued to uh, 18 newton meters and we use a crisscross pattern to, to to get this done so we're going to start up here one. I'm going to mark that that one's done. And if the flywheel turns on you, you can go ahead and get an extra pair of hands to uh, hold that, those teeth. If it's a problem, um, apparently there's enough cylinder resistance here that I'm doing okay. So we're going to go around these uh, once and then check them again. And we're just going to check alignment again while we're tightening that down. Everything should still be nice and tight in there. This tool should turn freely inside of the, uh, the spline, the friction plate. So we're good.
and there's no um, uh, thread lock or anything on there. It's kind of surprising, but no BMW manuals call for that. And I went and checked uh, the ROM manual for my 1200. And again, same thing. They don't use any sort of uh, thread lock on these. And that was what was told to me by a BMW technician as well. Okay. So we'll put our clutch alignment tool in, just make sure that, that that's basically representing the, uh, uh, the clutch push rod and it slides right into the um, spring plate. And then that represents the transmission uh, input shaft and it turns in there freely. Everything's located where it should. So this is perfect. Now we're ready to put the transmission back on. When ordering the new clutch, I also ordered a new throw out bearing for the transmission. Now this is a standard practice when replacing an automotive clutch. And since the BMW R clutch has more in common with a car than a motorcycle, we're doing the same and replacing it as well. From the back of the transmission, remove the clutch engagement arm by removing this one bolt. The arm just moves up and out of the way through the opening in the case. Set it aside for later, but keep track of those two washers and bolt. You'll now have access to the rubber boot that covers the throwout bearing. Use a Phillips screwdriver to loosen the hold clamp and remove the boot. In the boot, you'll find a spring, so make sure that you don't drop that spring when the clamp is loose. With the transmission removed from the engine, you only need to push the clutch push rod back through the bearing and it'll slide right out. I'm glad we stopped to uh, change the throwout bearing. This guy here, there's play in it, like big time. You can see if you can hear it click when I move it. So throwout bearing was definitely gone. Here's the new one. It is absolutely solid. This replacement can be done with the transmission in the bike. You'll just need to free the bearing using some fine forceps style pliers. And of course, BMW makes a special tool to extract the bearing with the transmission and engine still bolted together. Put a little grease in the center of the new bearing and slide it back in the transmission, making sure it locks into the clutch push rod. Check the spring, rubber boot, and clamp, make sure they're all in good shape, and then re-secure them to the transmission. Check the clutch engagement arm bearing uh, for condition, and then grease it up and reinstall. It's a simple operation, but the throwout bearing in this bike was bad, and I didn't even know it. An extra $100 in parts just saved a lot of frustration. So before we get to, uh, to putting the transmission back up uh, and on, I just want to talk a little bit about the clutch. Um, mechanism back here and this clutch adjustment works a little bit differently in the whole setup that BMW uses and this was something that I recently learned as well so because we've done a brand new clutch new brand new clutch spring uh, obviously there's gonna be way more tension on the the, the clutch actuator here in other words it's gonna want to come back further because there's more meat up front pushing it back uh, so what I've done here, as also as part of the exercise of changing out the uh, throwout bearing, is that uh, we've taken the adjustment all the way back on this arm. And the reason being is, is that when you set this up to start with, um, you need to use, basically set up the lever and um, uh, set up the free play there. And then you go down and set this up. So uh, this is the final adjustment that you would make on adjusting the clutch and usually you do it the other way around that you would you know kind of hook this up and then make all your adjustments at the uh, at, at where the the cable goes into the lever because you've got those gnarled uh, threads that you can go in and out and adjust that but no those are there's specific um, ratios in there that have to be maintained and once they're set up at the lever you're not supposed to touch them in other words you're not supposed to adjust your clutch on um, this type of, 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 of BMW uh, up at the lever. The adjustments are made here at the back. Okay, one final thing I forgot, just about forgot, uh, when it comes to putting this transmission back in, is to lube the splines. And that's pretty critical stuff. 
since we want this to last. And like I said, we kind of lucked out here. The splines are in really good shape. Uh, I was severely worried that there would have been some spline damage. Um, there's a little distortion, ever so slightly, but certainly serviceable. So this uh, spline loop came with the, uh, the new clutch assembly, so that's what we're going to use. You notice that I'm not putting it into fr friction plate. I'm not putting any lube onto the friction plate. Uh, again, was told that's not where you want to put it, no matter what the manual says. You want to put this spline lube um, onto the transmission input shaft. And that's what we're going to do. And it doesn't look like anything special. But we're going to work this into all of the teeth that are here. I'm actually a little disappointed in this loop. I thought it would be something more of a paste. This is the stuff from Germany, so we're gonna go with it. So we're gonna work that into the splines. You don't need gobs and gobs of it. Again, you don't want this getting onto the friction plate. So just get it back there and make sure it's worked into the splines. Clean up some of the excess. And basically what this is, there's an anti-seize co uh, component of it, as well as the lubrication component. And it just hangs out here for a very long time, like a molly grease. If I didn't have this, that's what I would use as molly grease. Okay, so we have a little bit left over. I'm gonna hit a couple of places. Additionally, in uh, in the back of the, the bell housing, basically those uh, guides, that are here. So that we don't if we have, we have to lube the splines again or something down the road. That we have a little easier time getting that on and off. And it's not seized. So we're ready, we kind of got this up to a point where we can start to work it inwards and get it on the back of the bell housing. Um, again, our, our, our locator pins are in, in place, so uh, that's good. We're going to work the bell housing on and then uh, uh, slide it forward. And we may need to adjust the transmission input shaft uh, just so it lines up on the splines. But other than that, things should go pretty smoothly. So after putting the drive shaft back on, it might give you the leverage that you need to help align. There it is. It went in there. Yeah. That was it. Okay. So now we can take our top bolts and get them started into the engine case. Before we put these in, I am going to put a little anti-seize on them, get these started, just give them a little bit of torque. You do need the bolts to uh, pull the transmission on the rest of the way, otherwise you'll be fighting against the clutch spring. The clutch spring is what's holding this stuff back now. So. Without the transmission bolts um, helping you get this on, you're gonna be here for a very long time. Just remember that the bottom of the transmission has this bracket that has a uh, mount for a, a tie down on it. So that, that tie down goes on the right side of the bike. So this is on a very, very weak clutch setting. Just wanna get that up in there.
sure we don't cross thread anything. There it is. Yeah, just be patient with it and uh, gradually work the transmission onto the bell housing. So now that we have our six transmission to bell housing bolts in place, we need to torque them down and these are torqued to 22 Newton meters. And just for fun, I am going to use a little bit of a crisscross pattern. get this done. Now we have our transmission back in place. We have, uh, gonna just make sure these wires are sorted out and then we can start to put the air um, our box housing back in and start to lower our frame. So yeah, things have uh, moved along quite nicely. So before we get too carried away, uh, I just want to make this adjustment on the, on the clutch that we talked about and uh, make sure that we've got everything set up properly. I did purchase a new clutch cable. So we're gonna run that. Um, figured we've got a brand new clutch, might as well have a brand new clutch cable. Not that the clutch cable is difficult to change, it's just the one that's on there probably has some play in it. It's been stretched a few times. So this one here, we're going to install and uh, run from the uh, handlebars down and then we'll make all the adjustments that we need to for the clutch. So there you can make out um, the differences between the new and the old clutch cable. Um, the old clutch cable is quite thin compared to the new one. The new one's much, much thicker. So, uh, probably a good upgrade. There was really nothing wrong with this old clutch cable, but like I said, for the expense and the hassle, um, we might as well replace that. But yeah, the new one is uh, quite a bit thicker. So to set the clutch up on this uh, R1100 RT, I've gone ahead and uh, installed the new clutch cable, uh, run it in its proper routing and uh, affixed it to the to the clutch lever here. Uh, I've also set it up on the uh, the transmission as well. Now there's no adjustment on the bottom end of, of this uh, clutch lever, so all your adjustment basically happens here at the lever and at the back of the transmission. So in order to set this up properly, what we're supposed to do here is make sure that the gap between these two gnarled sections on the adjuster is 12 millimeters. So I have my calipers out, trusty calipers. I've adjusted to 12 millimeters and we see we're almost there. Maybe a little more adjustment. And that to me feels bottom down. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab a pair of pliers and make sure that that's locked. Check it again. And we get a little bit of gap now. So slack that one off a bit and tighten this guy down. So we have our 12 millimeters here. That's it. That's all we do up here. The rest of the adjustment is going to happen out back. And the next goal with the adjustment out back, what we're trying to do is have the free play for when the clutch starts to kick in at seven millimeters. In other words, we want to have seven millimeters of free play up here before the clutch starts to engage. So. We'll reference our calipers. So what we have out back here is um, the lever that goes into the throat bearing. And you have a 10 millimeter head held here on the adjustment screw and then 13 millimeter uh, lock nut. 
So we want to tighten that in until we um, basically bottom out and then start backing it out. So now we're bottomed out against the uh, throw up bearing. But that, of course, eliminates that seven millimeters of play. So what we've got to do is we've got to back this out and arrive at that seven millimeters of play. Doing this properly is the difference between your clutch lasting a long time and not lasting a long time. So now this is a little tricky. We're gonna have to hold our um, adjustment bolt and then tighten up that tighten up that lock nut and of course BMW does make a special tool for this because BMW makes a special tool for everything and there it is we have our seven millimeters of play right before the lever starts to engage and that clutch action is fantastic so I lubricated the uh, transmission out, or the front drive shaft spline, to go onto the drive shaft. Now the next thing we want to do is phase the drive shaft and make sure we stay that way. So we need to make some marks here. Basically, what we want to do is make sure that um, the yokes that are on the drive shaft stay in line. In other words, when we bring the uh, the, the other piece in from the uh, final drive into these splines that that end of the yoke basically it's going to be this part down here uh, aligns with this one so basically what we're going to do is mark the center of the drive shaft yoke <laughs> and where that goes we want to make sure that because these splines have multiple, you know, places where you can put them in, that we keep that aligned. Is it an absolutely crucial deal? Is it a make or break? Going to ruin your 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 ride? No. But it is the proper way to do it. All right. So we've lubed up the uh, drive shaft splines there. We've marked. Uh, the drive shaft alignment so that we make sure that it's phased properly with the final drive. So now it's time to go ahead and put that drive shaft on. And to get it back on, you just need to tap it a little bit like that. Don't need to use a hammer or anything like that, just pops on place and that's it. Okay, uh, next up is the swing arm. And we'll need our cleaned up bolts, basically the, the blind pin and the adjustment pin uh, for the swing arm. So we'll put those in their prospective places. The other thing that came out of doing some research for this uh, particular video and getting the parts list together for it was that I came across some performance options for the R1100 uh, and 1150 uh, RTs. Now, I thought, wouldn't that be cool? We can take a look at this bike as it stands in a relatively stock position once the clutch was fixed. Uh, and uh, then do some performance mods and see if we can get the performance of this bike somewhere closer to maybe a modern bike. And I thought that would be kind of cool to try out. So I have ordered some performance parts for the bike. So we're going to put it back together stock and uh, check out to see what we can get uh, performance wise out of it. So uh, stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit that uh, like and subscribe button. And uh, appreciate you watching the video, making it through this far. And hope you'll check out the other videos on the channel. I'm sure you're going to find something entertaining or at least equally informative on some of the other videos.